let's continue on with the larynx. Now in the previous video, we looked at nasal cavity and then pharynx, which is your throat. Now you get to the bottom of the pharynx, there's only two possible passageways. You got your larynx and trachea anterior to the front, then you got your esophagus posterior to the back. So we don't want to look at air going down the esophagus towards the stomach. We want to see it going through the larynx, down the trachea, and then further along. So going to the larynx right here, there are many cartilages in this area. The first one at the very top is the epiglottis. Of all these cartilages in this region of the larynx, this is the only one that's elastic. And you can think of this as like a cover that flips down over the top of your larynx when you swallow food or drink. This is one of two things that will help to keep food and drink out of your larynx and trachea. Just below that, number two, you see is the thyroid cartilage. Now, this is what makes up the bulk of the larynx by far. When you look at somebody's Adam's apple or voice box as what the larynx is, you see this big piece of hard, strong, high lean cartilage. That's that thyroid cartilage. And it's definitely to the front and lateral to the sides of the larynx, but you don't have any posterior to the back. That's fine. This hard, strong, high lean cartilage will forcibly hold these air passageways open. As long as you got it to the front and to the sides, that's more than enough. Now, just inferior to the thyroid cartilage is the cricoid cartilage, a little smaller piece is just inferior to it. And there's a little bit of a gap between that thyroid and cricoid. It's a good place to insert an air tube if it were to be needed. What's called a cricothyrotomy there. There aren't any blood vessels or nerves in that region. So if you have to insert something for uh, someone to breathe through in that region, that's a good place to do it. Also, there are uh, the arytenoid cartilages. Now, these cartilages here have got skeletal muscle attached to one side of them, and then the vocal cords, what's also called the vocal folds, to the others. Now, what happens when the skeletal muscle pulls on this cartilage? The vocal cords will lengthen. They'll get longer. You relax this muscle, and they'll get shorter. And when you change the length of those vocal cords, that's what changes the sound of your voice as far as high and deep. Anytime they get shorter, the sound of the voice is higher. When they get longer, the sound is deeper. So looking at the vocal cords here, there are a couple of elastic tendons. Think of like taking a rubber band and stretching it between your thumb and index finger and then plucking that rubber band. It'll vibrate and of course that'll produce sound that we can hear. Something similar to that happens when we run air over these vocal cords and force those to vibrate. The vestibular folds, or tissue that you see on either side of the vocal cords. And another thing you can do to keep food and drink from getting down your larynx is to bring the vocal cords together that brings the vocal folds together. So that'll make a cover over the top of the larynx. And then that epiglottis flipping over the top of that will also help to do the same. The glottis is not a structure, but a little passageway in between those vocal cords and that tissue that's on either side of them laterally. And in this region of the larynx, you'll find an epithelial tissue that's pseudostratified and ciliated. Remember, cilia are good for moving things over the surface of cells in many cases. That's what you see them doing. And they'll move this mucus with any type of debris trapped in it that came in with the air we were breathing. So you get to the bottom of that larynx. Now you're going to move down your trachea. You're talking about your windpipe right here. Of course, you can see part of it right to the very front, anterior in your neck. So to the inside, you'll see some dense regular connective tissue and some smooth muscle. We'll look more at it further along. But you can also actually see and feel <clears throat> some of these C-shaped hyaline cartilages right down the front of it. Again, you got this cartilage to the front and lateral to either side. And that is not there for protection. That's to forcibly hold those air passageways open. More posterior, you got this ligamentous membrane and smooth muscle, or just called trachealis smooth muscle in this region. And the cartilage will keep it from contracting too much. You don't want to narrow the radius of your air passageways very much. Because anytime you decrease that radius, thinking about the size of the pipe, it gets smaller. You get a lot more resistance, and you're going to get a lot less flow of air. And that's not good. But when we do something like contract uh, this muscle, like when we cough, that's narrowing the air passageway. Let's the air come out a little bit faster through a smaller pipe. But again, that cartilage hopefully won't let it contract too much. 
You also see an inner lining to the very inside. You got all this mucus with the little ciliated pseudostratified epithelial cells. Goblet cells are these epithelial cells making this mucus. And again, that mucus is damp. It's going to catch and trap just about anything coming in with the air. As long as it'll hit it, it'll probably stick to it. But when you get to the bottom of the trachea, it's going to split. It's going to branch off left and right. That's your left and right primary bronchi. The left one goes towards your left lung. Right primary bronchus goes towards your right lung. You get to the very bottom of that trachea where it splits, and there's a piece of cartilage called the carina. And this piece of cartilage has some little touch receptors on it. And if anything touches that cartilage, that's what stimulates a very strong and uncontrollable cough reflex. It's another autonomic response to help to keep materials out of your trachea and down in your lungs. But as you go through this trachea and all these bronchi, which are all these air passageways lower, deeper down inside, this is what we call the tracheal bronchial tree. Now, there's two different zones to this tree. There's a conducting and a respiratory. So looking at the conducting zone, this would be the first 16 branches. There's roughly about 23 in the average adult. So this is the bulk of them, the first 16. All the way through this conducting zone, you'll see cilia moving the mucus because of all the debris trapped in it. It'll move it up. As it moves that mucus up, take it to the top of your larynx where you'll swallow it. That'll take it down to your stomach, and stomach acids kill about anything. It forms what's called the mucociliary escalator. This conducting zone is just a passageway for air. You don't have any alveoli, so that means there being no gas exchange. You've got cartilage holding these air passageways open. And where this conducting zone starts at the trachea, it ends at the terminal bronchioles. Anytime you go past those terminal bronchioles, you'll start to see alveoli. You don't have any of those in this conducting zone. So again, we mentioned all this mucus in the cilia, moving the material in the mucus up and out of your air passageways. Again, you get to the bottom of the trachea, splits into your primary bronchi, the right one and the left one going to the lungs. Those will split into secondary bronchi, three on the right side, two on the left. Each one of these goes to lobes. These lobes are different segments to a lung. So there's your first branch, primary, secondary, going to be your second, and then your third, tertiary branch, all right, it's going to go down to what's called the bronchopulmonary segments. And there's 10 of those branches on the right, nine of them on the left. Again, the cartilage is not there for protection, holds these air passageways open. If you go down deeper and deeper through these bronchi, the passageways do get smaller, but anywhere in the conducting zone, they help to keep them forcibly held open. And then a hilum is where you've got all these structures going in and out of your lungs on the medial side. Again, if you look medial to the inside of each lung, where these structures are going in and out of your lungs, that is what that hilum is going to be. So there's our conducting zone. Now we got our respiratory zone. This is the last seven of the 23 branches. And what got past the cilia and the mucus, the macrophages will help to clean up. Here you do have gas exchange in this region because you do have alveoli. As soon as you pass those terminal bronchioles, alveoli start to appear. You don't have any cartilage in this zone. So something causes that muscle to contract and somebody gets a lot of inflammation in this region. What can happen during an asthma attack, these passageways in this respiratory zone can narrow to the point that somebody can't move enough air. There'd be too much resistance to its movement at that point. But anything past the terminal bronchioles down to the alveoli, that's where all these air passageways dead end into these microscopic air sacs. And that again is where the gas exchange happens. All around these alveoli, think of like tiny little round air balloons there. You'll see lots of elastic fibers. You stretch these every time you inhale air. And as they recoil, definitely helps to get the air out. It takes a lot more energy to get air into your lungs than what it does out. And this is one of the two reasons why. But also surrounding those alveoli will be pulmonary capillaries. And there you'll get that gas exchange between the air and the alveoli and the blood in these pulmonary capillaries. Again, with an asthma attack, can cause big trouble in this respiratory zone because there you don't have that cartilage to forcibly hold those air passageways open if they start to constrict too much. 
So there's your picture of the lungs again. Some of these uh, air passageways like trachea and bronchi. That'd be that carina structure right at the very bottom. There's the alveoli. They appear in clusters, look about like grapes. That's the only place the gas exchange occurs. There you see some of the major regions in the diaphragm muscle at the bottom and in the books at the 